All right. So this is what we were finishing up in class together. Questions four through six. Number four, uh, how about instead of number one, we only have one gram of iron nails dissolved, what mass of copper would be produced? So uh, feels like a math problem, feels like we should do a conversion table. And as soon as the pad is ready here, here it is, then we're going to draw our conversion table. And on one side, we'll put our question, what mass of copper? And on this side, we're gonna start with our given 1.0 grams of iron. I forgot to put the grams of copper over here. Grams of iron, and we're trying to get to grams of copper. So we're going to use our, we're going to use the balance equation to switch substances. But before we do that, we have to switch out of the units of grams and into the units of moles. So we go to our periodic table and can't get the pen to write everything that I put. Uh, 55.8 grams per mole. Now we're into our balanced equation. Get out of moles of iron, get into moles of copper. Those of you keeping track of units, notice that grams cancel out grams, moles cancel out moles. And so now we just have one more step is to get rid of those moles of copper and get into grams of copper. Periodic table says 63.5 and then that gives us our last cancellation and our calculator tells us 1.71 grams. Question number five, how many molecules? So as of right now, five and six both made it onto your test. You'll get a different chemical equation, but the same idea for five and six. The only reason why number four is not on there yet is because that'll be like the last question that I write on the test, which will say, in lab 12.1, one gram of iron nails is dissolved and a student collects 1.53 grams of copper. And then it will ask you part A, what is the theoretical amount of copper that should be produced? But experimentally, you only produce 1.53. So then you would do something called a percent yield. So question number four will be on your test. It's just gonna be, um, written in later once we cover what's called percent yield. Uh, questions five and six are already there. And so uh, feels like a math problem, conversion table. And we wanna end up with molecules of, molecules, I can spell it okay, molecules of carbon dioxide. And we are starting with atoms of magnesium. So we're gonna work through that conversion table. I'm gonna speed this up just a little bit. Throw that one up there. And of course, if you have a problem with number five, please put something in the chat, either to everybody or private so that I can walk you through those steps there for you to solve that one. Number six, what volume of carbon dioxide must be produced from four grams of this entire substance? Now, I don't remember if it was with this class or with fifth period that we discovered a, a mistake on number three from this assignment. I don't know where the mistake lies, or maybe I did figure it out. I don't even remember anything now. How about if I just solve it and then I'll explain what, I, what it is I found on number three. So if you're following the, the slides online, um, there's a slight discrepancy on this one with where we put this to, all right? So I think that it said in the question that we did together, number three, that the mass of this was like 508.4. So I quickly added that up and that was the mass of just one of these and this two should not be there. This two should be a two to balance the equation, not a two telling us that there is a big, huge complex of things attached to each other. Now you may have no idea what I'm talking about, but I'm just trying to explain to you why there could have been a mistake on the uh, slide for number three um, as it was written. I think I cut and pasted things poorly when I made these slides originally, but we discussed it in class correctly. So that part at least is covered. You're gonna take four grams of this lead stuff and you're gonna get out of the lead stuff and you're gonna get into or the grams of it. And you're gonna get into the moles of it, okay? Now, I think we said in class, it was 508.4 to one mole. That gets rid of the grams. Now we're in moles. Then we use the balanced equation. That too was supposed to be part of the balanced equation. So getting out of moles of the lead stuff and into uh, 
uh, moles of carbon dioxide is a two to two ratio. And then lastly, this should also say at STP. So this thing's just riddled with mistakes. Get, and I forgot to put the word moles. Get out of moles of carbon dioxide and get into liters of carbon dioxide and then finish that one up. And everything here is written correctly. Uh, I just wish I would have put a space separation there because sometimes when you get to these complicated chemical formulas, that two is not a balancing two. That two actually ends up being um, part of the substance itself. And I wasn't sure because I don't know much about the lead carbonate that's got a lead hydroxide attached to it. There could be a total of four things attached to each other there. Turns out there's not because this number right here is just for the, a single one of these. Enough talking about that, that's stupid stuff. Let's move into today's topic, which is called limiting reactants. Let's give you a moment to copy that down before I get going. My wife just said that our dog is having a bad day. Um, the bad day started because um, for, for Lent, I've given up eating fish and I've also given up drinking milk. And so normally when I eat my oatmeal in the morning, I put milk on it. And then when I'm done, there's just a little bit of remnants of milk down at the bottom and the dog sits there and waits and I let her lick up the rest of the milk out of the bowl. Um, but today I use soy milk. And the dog looked at that bowl and was like, what is this, right? So then the dog was upset. Um, the other thing that my dog, or my wife's dog, it's not really my dog. You know how you kind of have a dog that likes one of the people more than the other? My friend, oh yeah, that's a good one, Manoff. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that. I didn't catch what you meant by that. That was a good one. Um, uh, oh, my wife, when she puts lotion, like on her legs, the dog will come over there, you know, because we use, I mean, I don't want to sound all pretentious, but we use uh, expensive organic stuff, right? Well, because it's not a full of a bunch of chemicals, it's probably actually made with like plant and animal fats. And I mean, that's the way people put lotion on for thousands of years. And just in the last 70 or so years, we've come up with some synthetic materials and I don't know, they're probably petroleum based and stuff like that. I don't think that a dog would lick something that is petroleum based, right? Made from, from like actual petroleum oil. Um, so anyway, the dog usually licks the lotion off her legs after she puts it on. It's a border collie. They're very um, type A personalities and they're gonna do what they wanna do. Well, she said she just put a new lotion on today and the dog doesn't like it. So she just told me the dog's having a bad day because it didn't get its milk and it didn't get to lick the lotion off her legs and so on and so forth. So does that sound a little spoiled? Uh, I'm laughing because uh, I said I gave up uh, fish and um, what else did I say? Milk for Lent. Uh, Manal put on there that his friend gave up Google Classroom and homework. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> yeah, There's, I think, I think that um, Probably some of you might be a little jealous when you see how nice your parents are to the animals in the house than to you, huh? It's like, wait a minute, it's not fair. How can the dog be treated better than I am? I think one of the best commercials on television is the one where the lady is sitting there on the couch like she's reading a magazine and her cat is rubbing against her shoulder or her head. And you can hear the kid in the background yell, mom, I fell down. And she yells out, there's Band-Aids in the cupboard. And he goes, I'm bleeding. And she goes, then put on two, right? While she sits there with the cat. I'm sure many of you can relate. Uh, what is the maximum number of grams of copper sulfate that can be formed when 50 grams of copper react with 25 grams of sulfur? Um, if you look at these notes online, I think I've done a pretty good job of writing text boxes to kind of explain this idea. And how I would explain this in class 
is I talk about making cookies, which I know nothing about making cookies. For me, the only time I've ever made cookies is you go into the freezer or the refrigerator and you get out that little bag of dough and you squeeze them out onto a uh, cookie tray and then you have cookies. But people who really make cookies will know that you have to mix a bunch of ingredients. And so what I've made up on my, uh, I think it's still on the slides, is it's going to say that if you want to make cookies, among all of the ingredients that you need is maybe per dozen cookies, you need two eggs and a cup of sugar, right? So when you go into the refrigerator and you get out the eggs, there's a carton with, let's just say the carton's not completely full, has 10 eggs in it, all right? So you've got 10 eggs, you only need two to make a dozen cookies. Then you go into the pantry and there's that little uh, jar, you know, jar with the closing lid that uh, mom or dad has poured all the sugar into. And you uh, pour that into cups and you find out that you have three cups of sugar. So if you've got 10 eggs and three cups of sugar, and you want to make as many dozen cookies as you can, right? So let me, I, I should write this down because the numbers sound hard. So 10 eggs, you don't need to write this down, and three cups of sugar, right? And to make one dozen cookies requires, among other things, two eggs and one cup of sugar. Then doesn't it make sense that the maximum amount of cookies that you can make would be three dozen cookies because the three cups of sugar is going to run out. You can't make five dozen cookies with the 10 eggs because there's not enough sugar for those last couple dozen cookies. That should completely make sense if you listen to that whole rambling there at all. The three cups of sugar limited the chemical reaction of making cookies. All right. So if that works for making you know, for recipes, can't we say the same thing about general chemistry? If you are going to react copper with sulfur to make copper sulfide, and you take 50 grams of copper and 25 grams of sulfur, it does say that it's a two to one ratio. So maybe you could say, oh, look at that, Mr. Purser, it's perfect. You have twice as much copper as you have sulfur. Yes, that is true in terms of mass, but balanced chemical equations, the two and the one that we're looking at here, they aren't telling us about mass to mass ratio. They're telling us about mole ratio. So what we have to do to start this problem is we have to take our 50 grams of copper and convert that into moles of copper. And we have to take our 25 grams of sulfur and convert that into moles of sulfur. And we do that with our old friend, a two-step conversion table that just requires us to go to the periodic table and add up whatever it is that you have. In this case, both elements, so it's just the mass of the molar mass of the element. Now you do the division of those two uh, for those two conversion tables. I'm going to cheat and go to the next slide. You do the division from those two conversion tables and you get those two answers, all right? So really, we don't have, well, I mean, really, we do have 50 grams of copper. But what we really care about is that we actually have 0.79 moles of copper in 50 grams, that we actually have 0.78 moles of sulfur in 25 grams. In fact, we almost have identical number of moles for each of those, okay? Sounds good, having a great time. What does that do for us? Well, because the copper is being used up at twice the rate the sulfur is, based on the balanced chemical equation, we use two moles of copper every time we use one mole of sulfur. So if you have 0.79 moles of copper, that's going to run out and you're going to still have a little bit of leftover sulfur. I'm not very good at math, but something around maybe like 0.36. No, that's not right. Maybe 0.39 moles of sulfur will still be left over once the copper completely runs out. So what we would say about this, and I do want you to write this in your notes, is that copper is the limiting reactant reactant. That's an A there. I started writing an I for reaction. The limiting reactant. 
So of the two reactants, the one that runs out first is called the limiting reactant. Makes sense, doesn't it? Completely makes sense. All right, so on your chapter test, when I said to you there was no question like number three from that uh, mid-chapter review, or question four, I mean, there was no question like number four on your mid-chapter review, that's because I haven't written it yet because, well, no, there'll be two. There's gonna be, in fact, that now I'm not even telling full truth stories. Um, there's going to be a question towards the end of the test that looks just like this one does, where we take two reactants. It'll probably be a combination reaction. There's enough combination reactions out there for me to make 14 different versions of the test. And I'm just going to give you two different masses. And then you have to do two parts to it. Part A will say which of these reactants limits the reaction or is the limiting reactant. And you have to show me by converting the grams to moles and see which one runs out first. Okay. Second thing is, then it's going to ask, what's the maximum number of grams of product that you get? So to find the number of grams of product that you get, you're going to take the one that's the limiting reactant and start all over. Actually, you don't have to start all over. You could just continue this problem from 0.79 moles of copper and keep working it. But I don't want to scare anybody with something that seems different. Let's instead just say, let's do a conversion table that takes the one that is going to limit the amount of mass or amount of grams of copper sulfate. And let's do a complete conversion table based on that one. So 50 grams of copper, get out of copper, get into, or out of grams of copper, get into moles of copper, just like you already did up here. So that's why you could continue on with 0.79. Then use the balanced chemical equation to get out of moles of copper and into moles of copper sulfide. Uh, balanced equation says two to one. Those of you keeping track of units will notice that the grams canceled off the grams, the moles canceled off the moles, and we just got to go one more step to get rid of the moles of copper sulfate, sulfide, and get into grams of copper sulfide. Okay, and that requires us to go to our periodic table to add up two coppers plus one sulfur. Can I do it? 63.5 would be 127, 28, 29, 129, 139, 49, 159. 159.1 grams of copper sulfide and then cancel and then calculator. Okay, now on the next slide, because I've already seen this before, I didn't do that. What I did is I just took the one from up here and continue working it out. You won't have that option because there's this is going to be broken up into part A and part B. Part A is going to say, what is the limiting reactant, which, and then part B is going to say, what is the maximum number of grams that you can produce? Okay. Now I only have this one example today. Um, before I leave this slide though, we are going to start working on the homework together today. I think there's five questions. We're going to set up the first two together, and then I'm going to set you loose for the weekend to finish up your homework. If you understand what you're doing, feel free to start working on uh, Tuesday's assignment because it's more of the same. This is considered a hard enough section that we need to spend two days on it as well. Um, this is a crowd favorite on the AP test. AP chemistry test pretty much you can find one or two FRQs on every single year AP test that has limiting reactants as a step in a problem. Then we do other things with it. This would just be like the part A where they uh, want to know. I mean, really, we could say the part A and part B. And then there might be, you know, parts C, D, E, and F as well, asking other questions. But this would definitely be that. Okay, now. Not everybody in this classroom is going to take AP chemistry next year. You have other plans, which is fine. So I want to show you a fallback position that you can always do with a problem like this. There's no reason. You don't need to copy this down unless you want to, but I'm not going to give you time to copy it down in Zoom today. There's no reason why instead of us stopping here and finding the moles, what you could do is just take these two given reactants and work two conversion tables to solve for copper sulfide. 
then whichever one produces less copper sulfide, that tells us that the copper was the limiting reactant, and this is the maximum number of grams that you're going to produce. This is probably the easier way to solve the problem that we just did. This is the way I've always taught this to my classes because it's an easier thing to do is just say, hey, do two conversion tables that you already know how to do, find out which one produces less. So why am I being so rude to you? I'm not, I'm actually being nice to you because in AP chemistry, it's amazing how often that there is something that the problem begins with that requires us to do this step and find out the number of moles first. So because I've seen that trend on AP tests, I'm gonna start teaching my regular chemistry students to do the same thing so that next year when you're in AP chemistry, you're like, oh yeah, whatever, I know how to do this, no problem, okay? But not everybody in here wants to take AP chemistry. So if you want to, this is a way that you could get the same answer, um, maximize your partial credit, and if you did something wrong, um, and that's that. Chapter, five, chapter 12, homework number five, questions 21 to 25. I would like us to set up 21 and 22. We're not gonna finish them, but we're gonna set them up. So that means me giving you a few minutes to come up with a balanced equation for number 21. Oops, number 21 shows up on your test. That equation balance is already there. Not for everybody, but at least, I think at least two of the forms have, have this um, balanced equation. And it doesn't matter if yours is different because if you know what to do, it works for everything. So it's not like somebody's gonna be able to look back at chapter 12, homework number five and get the answer because the numbers that are given are different. So go ahead, write that balanced equation. Hopefully, you put a two in front of the carbon dioxide. Then you put a three in front of the H2O. Makes me nervous to put a three there because of three oxygens is an odd number. I don't like that, but we have one right there. And so now if I've got a total of seven of them, I only need three more to make this balance. So far, there are no questions on your chapter 12 test where you have to balance the chemical equation. All of the equations are already balanced so far. And if that changes, of course, I will let you know. But most likely you will not be balancing equations because I don't want to waste any time with that. Not when you've got the internet, because how is that fair? If you're just going to look it up on the internet, all I've done is just wasted 25 seconds of both of our time for you to write down the numbers that the AP test, or the AP test, the, the Google is going to tell you anyway, right? The part that Google can't tell you is if you type in Given 60 grams and 26 liters, uh, how many liters of CO2 will be produced? The only possible way the answer is online for that is if I took a question from some maybe chemistry textbook and that one was solved by another teacher and they posted it, right? So what are the odds of that? Well, it's not very good odds because I'm just making up the numbers as I go. Uh, I'm taking chemical equations from chapter 11 so I went back to uh, an assignment from chapter 11. In fact, I can even show it to you since I know you guys are having so much fun right now. See, look, there it is. Chapter 12, test A, that's the one I'm in the middle of writing. Uh, practice test, I'm hoping to give one of those to you. And then what I did to make my test questions, uh, this is just a, a rough, doesn't mean anything, is I just went back to chapter 11 and took this assignment, oops, because it already has 
all of a whole bunch of balanced equations so that I didn't have to go look on Google to see the balanced equation, right? I'm not going to balance myself. I have extra, extra time. I don't have extra time. So I'm just going through here and picking equations. And then, you know, basically you could say form A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then uh, period four forms A, B, C, D, E, F. And then flip-flopping to a next question will just be a different equation for you. So if you want to have those at your disposal, go ahead. What do you need them for? They're already going to be on your test. All right, back to where we were. So now what do you do? I'll give you a few more minutes because I've been talking your ear off. You've been listening to me instead of doing what it says, which is uh, figure out which is the limiting reactant. Give you a hint. You're going to do that. My wife is a believer that you should not give something up for Lent, that you should take something on for Lent. So Maybe you could volunteer to help out at like the uh, women's shelter in Victorville or um, something, right? And when we say doing something for Lent, please don't think that that means that you have to be of a Christian faith. We're just talking about a time period where people think about what they can do to make themselves better or make the world better. And every religion thinks that. Even if you don't have a religion, you should be willing to think that, right? So it works for everybody. And then we kind of hope sometimes, this is why we give something up for Lent, is if it's a bad habit, that once you break that bad habit, that then maybe you go, oh, I'll just keep not doing that, right? And then you uh, have now made yourself healthier by you know, either emotionally healthier, physically healthier, whatever, by giving up that bad habit. Exactly. 60 grams of ethanol. Get out of grams of ethanol. Get into moles of ethanol. So the only reason why there's somebody in this room benefiting from us doing this right now you won't have to add up two carbons plus one oxygen plus six hydrogens because you'll already have it written down as 46.0 grams per mole from your homework assignment. You just saved all that time. And then oxygen, uh, yeah, oxygen, we have 26.0 liters of O2 at STP, which means that we can use 22.4 liters of O2 to get into moles of O2. So those two givens were completely different units, yet both of them can take us to the same place, which is to finding the number of moles of each of the substances. Now, I don't have an answer slide for this, so I'm going to plug this into my calculator and just see what happens. 60 divided by 46 is 1.30. And 26 divided by 22.4 is 1.16. Okay, now take a look at that and tell me which one is the limiting reactant. And why? By tell me, I mean just think it. I think about it. You don't need to actually say it, unless you want to. I like hearing things in the in the chat. Like yesterday, I learned in the chat that, uh, let's see, this means like raising an eyebrow. That's awesome. Uh, somebody in one of their uh, uh, emails put uh, colon, period, colon, I think is what it said. And I'm like, what does that mean? And they said, it's a person with arms. I don't know if that's true, but... All right, fair enough. So you guys could throw something in the chat, just, you know, some emoji. 
computer keyboard emoji and then tell me what it means. I'm, I can learn too. The second one is crying. Is that true? So when you do this, that means you're crying. Oh, so it's like tears. Ah, so maybe the person was just being nice and just not telling me the, the truth about it or something or being mean or not. Huh, interesting. What if it was just like colon, colon? Does that have any meaning? You know what makes me nervous is that when I, you know, sometimes when you guys say something to me in an email and I'll put something back to you that's maybe slightly sarcastic, but I don't want you to think I'm being sarcastic, I'll put the little smiling face, right? I'm all, but remember, I don't have very, I have, I have excellent eyes. Like right now, you guys, when you come to school, you'll be like, he never wears his glasses. I never wear glasses when I'm in class because I can see an ant on the back table. What I can't see is the computer screen. And that's what happens when you get old is your eyes start going bad. So people who live in Southern California because of the amount of sunlight that we have, our, um, our lenses start to harden. And so because of that, they can't, uh, they're not flexible enough. So you can't see far away and close up very well. So one of the two goes away. For me, it's the close up. Anyway, so even sometimes with my glasses on when I type something, um, I'm always afraid that instead of pushing colon that I didn't hit the shift and that it's gonna send you this. If you ever get that from me, please don't think I'm being creepy. I'm not, I'm not being creepy. It was an accident. I was trying to send you this and I didn't hit the shift bar. And so therefore you got a winking face. That's creepy when a 49 year old man would send you a winking face. So please um, don't, uh, don't think anything of it. Donovan, I don't know what you put in there because all it gave me was just the square right, or the rectangle, right? It just did that. So. That was enough time for you guys to think about which one's the limiting reactant, right? And you're all thinking oxygen because there's less, less of it. Okay, Hansa, yeah. I don't know why the chat doesn't, why Zoom doesn't take all of the emojis. Interesting, but it doesn't. Um, back to what I was saying though here. You're all thinking oxygen's gonna run out first because there's less of it, no. Oxygen is going to run out first because it's being consumed at three times the rate and there's less of it. So when you use up one mole of ethanol, you'll have to use up three moles of oxygen. So if you have close to the same amount of each of them, we know that this one is our limiting reactant. Now you can take this and continue the conversion table and get out of moles of oxygen get into moles of, what are we trying to answer for? Carbon dioxide, and then continue this on to the end, okay? So that's how you need to do these, is you need to think about who's gonna run out first. Let's do one more together, number 22. Please try to balance that, it's a quick one. Exactly, you balanced it at 112. Now, let's set up two conversion tables. Get into moles of nitrogen and get into moles of oxygen. Because as of right now, what I see in this problem is there's 30 grams and there's 30 grams. So you're thinking, oh, Mr. Purser, they're perfect. They're going to run out at the same time because 30 grams and 30 grams at a one-to-one -one ratio. That's not a mole ratio. Those are masses. The numbers one and one is a mole ratio. So whichever one of those grams represents less moles is gonna run out first and is therefore the limiting reactant. We are gonna hope by practicing questions like number 22, that all my young AP chemistry students in this class wouldn't even need to do this first step. They would look right at a problem like this one and say, oxygen has a larger molar mass than nitrogen so if you've got equal masses of both, you really actually have less oxygen than you have nitrogen in this problem. That's what my young AP chemistry students are gonna be able to say by 365 days from now, okay? Really sooner than that. All right, let's prove that to you. You're gonna get out of grams. I'm going to get into moles. 
Periodic table says nitrogen is only 28 grams per mole. Periodic table says that oxygen is 32.0 grams per mole. When you divide 30 by 32, you get 0.94, significant digits, yeah, I'll keep them, 0.938. And then the top one, 30 divided by 28, you get 1.07. So you actually have more moles of nitrogen and less moles of oxygen. And if they're running in a one-to-one -one ratio, that tells us that the oxygen is a limiting reactant. Then you continue the conversion table. Okay, we're all good. I'm gonna stop the recording.